At this very moment, Britannia burns. Going back to Martian Dreams, where actually you do, you conjure, you conjure an M60 machine gun out of Dream Snot. Um, that happens. Technical term. I'm not lying. That happens. <laughs> um, yeah, that game, by the way, is a game well, I haven't mentioned in the series yet, but I will. That game is about the Avatar going to see Warren Spector. Literally. Beca yeah, it's Warren. <clears throat> it, his... Dr. Spectre. No, yeah. you see Warren Spectre because, well, when you're the Avatar, you can just go see Warren Spectre, because, yeah, sure. Anyway, Warren, Warren so, yeah, you get a letter from the past telling you, you need to go into space, like, right now. So you're the Avatar, and you go, okay. So then you go on the rocket ship, you get fired into space, and on the rocket ship is Warren Spectre and Sigmund Freud. And so now you go on a Martian adventure with Warren Spector and Sigmund Freud. So once again, I must ask the mushroom question. And two, <laughs> and two, why, why had I not heard of this game until like, until the, like, why was I so scared of this game? Because it sounds like the most awesome game ever. Yeah. Is going on Mars and killing things with Sigmund Freud and Warren Spector. Well, but you know what's also interesting about that is that um, this whole kind of Victorian science is mm -hmm. actually something that is near and dear to my heart. I mean, if you. Uh, if you look at the decorations of my house, there is uh, truly historical stuff like uh, uh, you know medieval arms and armor. Mm -hmm. There's truly futuristic stuff like spaceship parts and spacesuits. And then there's this interesting other thread that goes through this, and it goes through some of the automatons I collect. It goes through a lot of these quack medical devices I collect, and it goes through a lot of art. These kind of these these, these artists that make these found art pieces that often look kind of Victorian sciencey but quacky all at the same time. And, and, and even though there's a steampunk term that is common these days, but also commonly hated these days, mm -hmm. it's either loved or reviled, but long before those terms were ever assigned, I actually found a lot of stuff to be incredibly compelling. I find Victorian scientific apparatus to be, you, you can pull it apart and look at the pieces, and it's very, very inspirational. And so uh, when Warren decided to, you know, to, to help lead the uh, uh, Martian Dreams project, we were all very excited about it, and this was before the word steampunk ever came up, mm -hmm. but it's sort of a steampunky kind of thing in yeah. a sense. Uh, and it's a cool way to get both history and a little bit of technology all wrapped together. And then there's the Doc Savage inspired Savage Empire. Right. Which, cause and by the way, this, here's, a, here's, a, here's some trivia that almost no one knows. In fact, no one in the room I think knows this. This is inspired by Doc Savage. Mm. Uh, when I made this at the age of 11 or 12 or so, um, every summer I would do a new type of art with my mother. My mother was, you know, one summer would be pottery, one would be etching, one would be painting, one summer would be silversmithing. So this was when my mom was doing silver for this one year. During my summer break from school, uh, I had just watched this Doc Savage movie where the bad guy natives who were trapping him in a cage and they could blow this green smoke into the cave that made these kind of vapor snakes that try to eat Doc Savage and his buddies. And uh, my mom said, hey, what do you want to make out of silver? And I had just seen those marks on the chests of those natives. And I said, well, and my mom didn't see the show. And so I said, well, you know, I, the, the, the snake emblem would be really cool. And so she helped me refine this, this snake, which doesn't actually look like the one on Doc Savage, but it was just, but that's where the thought came from. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked this out, I sought it out, I sought it on my neck, and it's been there ever since, and it's become kind of my icon, but it's really inspired by Doc Savage. Uh, uh, oh, uh, speaking of children, why do you hate children so much? I love children. I don't know why you think I have this thing for children. You love dead children. You love dismembered children. I do love dead and dismembered children also. Because this happens, this is a common theme in your games, with the violent and brutal axe murdering of children. That's right. And, and it probably does deserve a little explanation. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, this actually goes back to Ultima IV. I know. <laughs> so in Ultima IV, uh, there were lots of tests of your virtue. Uh -huh. And there were lots of things that looked like tests to your virtue, even if I didn't have enough sophisticated code to actually be a test. <laughs> and so when I was making dungeon rooms, which could have no, there was no test of your virtue in any dungeon room uh -huh. because the code didn't exist. Okay. But yeah, you screwed me then. Yeah, so I knew, but I knew you'd behave as if, the, if I made the room look right, you would, you would think it was a test. And so um, 
For example, uh, I built a room with a what looked like doppelgangers of your whole crew, your whole yeah. team on the other side. Yeah. And in fact, it wasn't a test, but I knew you might go, oh, should I kill them or shouldn't I? You know, yeah. maybe there's some moral quandary here. I remember. But in that. fact, they're monsters, so just kill them. And I made another room where there was a lever in the middle of the room, cages in the corners full of children. Children. But anything in a dungeon room, by the way, is a monster. Any living thing yep. is, is, by the code's definition, it can be any icon I want. Remember there were the floors that moved around and yes. attacked you even in Exodus. I so, remember this, yes. Yeah, so that was just getting desperate for what new monsters you could come up with. I have no room for icons. No icons left. The floor is a monster. And um, so these children were monsters. And when you pull the lever, the monsters are surrounding you and attacking you. And I thought, oh, you're supposed to be the avatar. You'll probably think, you'll probably worry that you're going to lose some points right here before the very end if you kill the children. But I knew they were monsters, so go ahead and kill them. And, uh, That's sick, dude. But <laughs> one of our QA testers saw that room and wrote a letter to my brother. And my brother came to me with this letter and goes, Richard, what have you done? And I'm going, what do you mean, what have I done? And he shows me this letter where the QA tester goes, I refuse to work for a company that so clearly supports child abuse. And, and Robert's going, no, 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 not abuse. <laughs> Murder. <Murderer. laughs> but Robert's going like, what did you do, Richard? And I'm going, I don't even know. And so we have to do some research yeah. to find out that he's talking about this room. <laughs> and my brother's going, Richard, you've got to take it out of the game. And I'm going, Robert, I can't take it out of the game because I've actually provoked, provoked an amazingly strong this, emotional reaction. This is exactly this is exactly how I got, not exactly how, but this is how I got started doing the videos. Is because I provoked an emotional response. It was negative. But, but it's okay. But people were watching. But, yeah. but... Exactly, and and uh, and so I was very proud of the room. My brother and my mother and my father all tried to talk me out of keeping the room in the game. I refused to take it out. We shipped it in the game, and no one ever commented on it ever. Yeah. But ever since then, I've sort of pushed the line a little farther, a little farther. And so with Ultimate Five and Six and Seven, not only did I always include the homage to the room of killing children, but I often tried to find a way to up the ante as much as possible. Yeah. And so uh, there'd be times you'd pull a lever, and instead of opening the door for the children to come get you, you would open the door between a monster and the children, <laughs> and therefore you would be responsible for the death of the children. I missed this one. Where was this? This uh, was in five. Uh, probably five. Oh my god! And then if you use one where you pull a lever and the trap door opens beneath the building, you dump them all under the. Lock. What? Then there's the children of the corn. Yeah, I've got the children of the corn ones. So yeah. you go out into the mushroom field, and the children, zombie children, all come out, and you have to kill off all the children. I missed the lava. That's horrible. Yeah. So there's <laughs> ones for uh, every Ultima has one, and uh, but by the way, there's a woman who worked for us on Tabula Rasa. Her name is Susan Kath Susan, and Susan was in charge of making sure that in Tabula Rasa there was the homage to killing children. <laughs> You're in charge of this, and, yeah. Susan, and she didn't do it. She wouldn't do it, or she she didn't do it, or she, she wouldn't do it. She didn't do it. Okay. She wouldn't do it, and didn't do it. Okay. I kept telling her to do it, and she just never did do it. And I and so the game shipped without it, and so I'm I'm pissed. And so yeah. Susan, we're coming for you. I want this woman dead. She's yeah. You will you will die, gloriously, along with the children, in this game. And Richard shipped a special patch to the game that day. <laughs> Adding the children killing. Them. Yeah, there's there's a movement to like uh, a user group is trying to bring Tabula Rasa back online as a user community. I'll make sure they put back in the children. They, they'll put a special like child army task force, like exactly. you know the like Ender's Game, the child army that is trained mercenaries. Anyway. Exactly. Um, where where it really started pushing the line for me was um, when you got to Ultima Seven and you see the ritualistic sacrifice on uh, the Forge of Virtue. Mm -hmm. That kid is freaking dismembered. Literally. And yeah. Dissected, and that's not even where it gets, starts getting ugly. Oh, and it's, by the way, wait till you see what we have in store for this game. Oh my so, god! <laughs> so for Surrounding the Avatar, so I I already had it was funny for me having this discussion with Tracy Hickman because how do you introduce to your writing partner that you really want to push the lines of comfort and good taste, uh, you know, potentially farther than you ever have. And uh, uh, and so we have a we have a we have a plan. Uh, in this case, it's my plan. So if you get to this place and you're going like, oh my God, who, what what sick f did this? Blame me, and uh, you'll know when you see it. Oh no, I see. It. Well, well, if I can ask, are you shooting for a particular game rating on this one? Um, no, no. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's gonna let pieces fall <coughs> where they may. Yeah, let, let let the dismembered body parts fall where they may. Okay. Um, the Ultima 8 was, oh, actually, no, going back to Ultima 4, where I was afraid was when the children started attacking you, was not necessarily killing them. I was like, okay, if they're attacking me, it's on them. 
Okay. Fair. My question was like, if, okay, if I don't want to kill them and I run, that's uh, not oh, valorous. Oh, oh, good. That's good. not valorous. So <laughs> now I'm like, he's making me do this. Right. Because I don't want to kill them, but if I run, I'm running from children. Right. And if I run in combat, no, if I if, in Ultima Four, if I run in combat, it's cowardly. Right, but by the way, these are the sort of mental debates I was trying to provoke by putting that setting in the room. And when my brother confronted me about this and insisted I take it out, and I, well, as I was refusing, I said, look, there's all other kinds of solutions to this. First, don't pull the lever. It's a lever! you got to pull the lever! Second, charm the children. Third, put them all to sleep. <laughs> Fourth, if you drop your sword, which you actually might kill them in one blow because they're children, and instead you punch them... <laughs> They will actually go below 25% hit points, and then they will run away from you. Okay? So there's... Just punch, punch the children. There's punch them. Other. <laughs> hit them until they flee. Hit them until they flee. But the point is, there's plenty of other options. You don't <laughs> show have them, to murder the children. Show them the back of your fist. That'll teach them. To in, <laughs> in Ultima 4, you don't have to murder them. But, by the way, in 5 and 6 and 7, you do have to murder them. <laughs> Remember, folks, show them the back of your hand. <laughs> like, don't kill them. Yeah, just child, child stands up to you. Sure it probably won't kill them. It probably. <laughs> exactly. That it is. In eight, in eight, you get attacked by a mob of feral children, which I know is one of your favorite moments, mm -hmm. where I just like you, you're just murdering them with an axe, and then I start scrolling the list of virtues up to like adagio for strings. And I'm like, this is what you've become. You know, just like, oh. right, right. Um, which I think is kind of the point of the game, really. But well, but that's sort of what I did in in the ultimate. You know, it's it's too bad ultimate didn't get better. Finished before it launched because there's a lot of things I really yeah. like about Ultimate. So do I. Uh, but uh, uh, but but well, one of the things that's sort of the culmination of is this journey where, you know, you know, I think the virtues that are pointed out in four actually are really lasting. I actually really believe that you know truth and love and courage are some foundational, you know, uh, pillars of goodness that you can at least have as a discussion item. Not that it's truth as in capital T, but yeah. it's got what Stephen Colbert would call truthiness. Truthiness. And so it's very truthy. Um, but uh, but I also like in each subsequent Ultima I try to talk about either virtues or social issues with some other kind of twist. And the thing I liked about Ultima Eight was to say, you know, look, if you uh, you know say what you want about uh, you know pick your most hated religion on earth compared to what you are, you know, and classically today you you might see you might you might say that people in the West versus people in the Middle East. Uh, you know, are have, have have deep suspicions about each other's you know religious morals, shall we say? Well, going back to your thing, no no person who's evil thinks they are. And by the way, in this case, probably neither one of them are evil. Yeah. And uh, they they both truly believe and in fact are trying to do good in the world. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, the thing I liked about Ultimate was saying, okay, well, what if we throw you in an environment where you know it's perfectly something you don't believe? Yeah. I mean, I, I wanted to set it up to where it's it's very very unlikely that you will think. Devil worship is really the way you ought to be. Yeah. But if that's the world you're in, what do you do about it? What do you, how do you deal with it? How do you uh, live within it? Well, uh, this is. I was gonna talk about this later, but I guess it's now as good a time as any. Is why do you hate God so much? Because now, um, this is you. You start off with this really, really great system of virtues. It's kind of bulletproof, really. You know, you've got these, you know, truth, love, justice. You've got these things to live for, and it's basically godless. Uh -huh. You know, the, God has nothing to do with any of this. In fact, Britannia is strangely atheistic yeah. to the point where nobody worships anything. You got the you got the serpents up there, and the Ophidians kind of worship them. But we don't even really talk about them. Right? Nobody really worships anything, and really nobody even mentions it. And the right. Avatar comes around. He's or the you know whoever becomes the Avatar comes around, and he's still got these things going on. Right. And he masters all that. And okay, you got this kind of bulletproof system. It works out okay. And then every other game past that shows you what a stupid idea that is. <laughs> Of what those belief systems yes. are? Yes. Or, or, or even the virtues are. Yeah. Uh, all of it. All, all of it. it. Oh, no, well, that's because... It, it, so the, the, my, the, the reason why you're finding me attacking everything, including my own... Even your own. Even your own. Is because I actually... I'm a deep believer that anything... <laughs> I'm going to contradict myself. 
any, I'm a deep believer that anything you believe should be challenged. Sure. Because I think that's not, it, it's, it's deciding that you know the truth mm -hmm. that sets you up for failure. Yeah. And so uh, I don't care what your belief is and, or mine is or that I've proposed. If you, as soon as you buy into whatever I propose, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you why it's wrong. Yeah. Because I, I think that, the, that you really need to be more nimble. People need to be much more open-minded and much more self-critical. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, so I both I I both love m picking on the relatively easy targets. Sure. You know, like a, a lot of cult-like subsects of religions right. that get a lot of grief anyway, and I often pattern after them because they're relatively easy to analyze and to to uh, put in in a mm -hmm. way that is obfuscated. But even whether it's major religion or my things I propose, uh, I I'm just as happy to rid it. Uh. Like you take my characterization of the avatar, which is hyperbolic to be certain, but it's fair enough. Like I go here, I will, I show up on at Britannia, and I go, "Hey everyone, I'm the avatar," and they go, "I'm here to help." I'm here to help, and they go, "That's nice." You are again, and I go, "Hello, avatar," and they go, "That was like 200 years ago," and I go, "Statue, hello, help me out, gargoyle problem," and they're like. Okay, you're the avatar. What do you want from me? And I'm like, weapons, please. The fate of the world is at hand here. I need some help. Would you please help? You know, like, yeah. I, well, I, by the way, I agree with you. Exactly. Completely. Exactly. So, but the thing is, now I'm not exactly being humble here, but I'm correct. I could. Oh no. Well, you could use the help. I mean, obviously, it's come. And, and that's actually one of the things I've I've, uh, I've enjoyed about listening to your game analysis, not just of my own work, but other people's work too. Is uh, is is finding those cracks in our young art form, mm -hmm. uh, and just saying, guys, it's not acceptable for these kind of cracks to exist. If we're trying to prove that our games are literature are are as worthy as a good movie, you, we can't have those cracks. I don't think what I'm saying is I don't think it's a crack necessarily. Is is where you know my guy shows up and he starts demanding things, even well, if I'm, but that but that should require but that but the game shouldn't. Shouldn't uh, not have you be remembered. Yeah. If there's a statue to you in the street corner, but the game might should dock you if you're boisterously going around like saying, "Aha, I'm here!" You know, everybody bow down to me. Oh, no, yeah. That might also be bad. Exactly. Exactly. So but, you know, um, but you want to find the correct solution to uh, to to the, to that uh, uh, that situation. Exactly. So, but yeah, you've got this. You've got this problem where you've got any kind of you know uh, philosophical theological figure showing up no matter how good the system of ethics or you know justice or religion is you've got this problem where let's, the virtues are flawless on its face and then every game since then shows you how flawed they are you know because what if somebody makes them mandatory right and then you know my character he's like good news everybody <coughs> I found the Bible boom <laughs> bad news. I just kicked down the door to the gargoyles' holy sanctum, and I stole their Bible. Right. That's the bad thing, and I killed about all of them. Most to do of them. It. Yeah. To do it. So now, like now, it's like you know, I've done this. But isn't that already true? Through think, think about it, think about history. History is full. History and contemporary problems are full of things like the Crusades. Yeah. Where people go. Look how righteous I am. Look what good deeds I'm doing for my philosophy, belief, and deity. Exactly. My guy shows up and goes, I'm the Avatar. You guys are safe. Right. You know? So, like, my guy goes, boom, I'm Jesus, basically. Right. And I am. Basically. Yeah, from these people and their perspective, you are. The, no, the book says so. Right. The book says so. Right. I am. So, like, what's the problem? And then the gargoyles come up and they're freaking pissed. Exactly. And I'm like, what's their problem? Yeah, and they're like, "That's our book," and I'm like, "What was that?" I took it. Fair and square. I took it. No, you guys are freaking ugly, and then books and the books. Yeah, not yeah. you guys look like demons, man. You got teeth and horns and, and the wings. Book, and the book is the book says. I don't know what the book says. I can't read it. I'm like, you know, I don't know. I don't, there's no rules here. I don't know. So let's send it to space. Um, and then the Lord British. Really, by the way, Lord British is a dick in that game. You, well, he's never terribly useful, but uh, but why are you uh, why 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 are you casting this particular aspersion? In, okay, in, in Ultima Six, 
he's like, he, he calls you to the court and he says, okay, the gargoyles, he doesn't know what's going on. Nobody else is going on. He's like, the gargoyles are just boiling up from the underworld. They're just, they're rampaging an avatar. We need you to stop them. We need you to, he basically tells you to exterminate them. Right, yeah. He's, he's, like, side. he's like, he's like, we need you to wipe out these gargoyles because they are just ravaging And they them. are. Then they are. Yeah. They are, and they're, and, but they're rightfully so, but you don't know this. So you find out why they're mad, and you've devised this plan to bring peace between them. You know, you discover you're the false prophet and all that stuff. And so you you go to Lord British, and he's like, they want what? The Codex. Well, they can't have it. Right. It's so important to us. It's, it's ours. It is ours. It's, it's how we built the whole virtues, the yeah. whole system it's of, like, this of is, greatness. This is our thing, and you're the Avatar. You know this. It's, exactly and right. so he's not helping. So right. at the end of the game... You actually go behind his back, and you send the codex into the into, into the void. Into the void, you essentially have to force him into a truce right. with the gargoyles. Right. Got a problem with that? Exactly. Yeah, I kind of have a problem with that. So, like, you start to realize, like, there's there's kind of like some holes being punched in the Lord British character, which I don't think are ever explained. Oh no, no, but but again, I, I but Lord British, I, I don't think I don't think any of the series would have worked had Lord British been Oh, if this, he just agreed? Yeah, if he no. was this omnipotent and or super powerful, either one. If he was either particularly powerful or particularly correct uh, or universally helpful, all any one of those three would actually bring you to your knees to a point. I actually think you make you made some great points about things like, you know, if you if Lord British has literally summoned you from another world to come here and open these magical gateways between worlds and the amazing amount of power it would take to pull that off since it's not an everyday event. Yeah. And then says, hey, by the way, I, I don't even have a sword for you. You yeah. go buy one. Thank you. I mean, that's a that's obviously a level of lack of helpfulness that needs to be fixed. I love, I love that. You know, in Ultimate Underworld 2, he's like, oh, there's this dome of black rock surrounding us. Avatar, go help. I'll be here. <laughs> yeah, like, you're, you're literally wearing a suit of leather armor. And you, I don't even think you have a knife. <coughs> you, you're like, I'll just, I'll go into the sewers then, and yeah. you have to go like steal Dupre's knife. <laughs> right. Well, well, that's why, that's, well, that's why I think, you know, and hopefully we'll get this considerably better in spite of the Avatar, uh, in spite of our demoing to you today of killing chickens, <laughs> um, you know, which I, I could hardly believe that was what the team decided to show was, let me check, let me, oh, I'm like, man, that's, that's a tough chicken, man. Yeah. That's a scary Look at that. Look at that. Whoa. Beast. Okay, it uh, took it. It took the shot. It took uh, two shots. Two shots. <laughs> three uh, shots. It oh, took three shots. It took three swipes of the avatar's mighty blade to fell the fowl. Practice with any sword to kill a few chickens. It took three shots. No, it took three. Oh boy! But because uh, we used to have this sign on the wall that obviously needs to go back on the wall, uh, and it was the big no sign on top of a club and a rat. And, uh, no you know, rat clubbing. Yeah, no rat clubbing. Meaning, meaning, look, it's just uh, there. You know, while we need you to have some progression, by all means, um, you need to arrive feeling not so utter. You know, if if you're the avatar hero who's returned from Earth to help save the world, um, you know, you need to not um, uh, start out quite so squirrely. Pest control. Yeah, this is my problem. <laughs> Thank you.